Well, there's a lot that goes on in the book of 2 Peter. A lot of figures from the Old Testament. There's a lot of harsh, piercing words. In the midst of all that, you, we're often surprised that there's a lot of hope and goodness promised to God's people. But in reality, one of the reasons why I wanted to preach from 2 Peter was actually this third chapter. You got to get through a lot. And here the horizon seems so bright. In our text this morning, you've got judgment and redemption. You've got prophets. You've got scoffers. You've got hope-filled apostles, but you also have those who are aiming to infuse the church with a lot of doubt. And amazingly, this is one of the most hopeful things that you and I can ever hear. Our text reminds us that when the world is turned upside down, it was done so by a total flood. To the point where our world feels turned upside down, even in our own midst, but we can find the hope of Christ in the midst of that. To the point where there will be a time when the world very much feels like it'll be turned upside down and it'll come through a fire where the heavens roar and the earth literally melts. All in 10 verses, those things are happening. Now, you and I have to come to this with the understanding of what the gospel is all about. The gospel has in its understanding that in the beginning of everything, in our understanding, everything was very good. God made literally everything. He did it through Christ, and he made it all very good. But not soon after, we know that the Bible teaches that not soon after God made everything good, not soon after God made man and called him good, that man's actual own desire took over God's desire and man thereby made everything bad by his own sin. And there the the promise of the scriptures seemed to go on a rapid chase to bring into man's own existence the very God who created him, the son of God who came in order to turn over everything that man tried to turn over for themselves. Where God intervened again, not just in creation, but now by bringing his son Jesus to make a new creation in man's own heart, where he then promised that he would come again and judge all wickedness that man brings on themselves, but also to pull together man to himself in a final eternal existence where man, just like was created to live in harmony with God in the garden, man will be placed now permanently in the new heavens and the new earth with God forever in the new kingdom. Now, within that, we see the the totality and the goodness of the very person of Christ. We see that all throughout the year, all throughout the scriptures, where God the Son, who was eternal, actually condescended to earth. He lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death. He then was raised from the grave to new life, giving you and I hope that if he was raised from the grave to new life, you and I can have hope that we'll be raised to new life as we walk with him in paradise forever. Then he preached for 40 days about everything that he had just done, and then he ascended into heaven where he rules and reigns. And it's at that part that scoffers in this text are saying, he's not coming back. He's going to rule and reign, and everything we're doing down here doesn't matter. And in fact, everything you do down here doesn't matter. So you can do whatever you want. Imagine for yourself if all of this existence of of God coming and living and dying and raising and ascending, what if none of that was true? What would you do? Now now we see where all the sin comes out, right? And I know that some of you are going, I would do this and that. Don't do that, friend. Why? In part because... The God who came like this calls you by your own regeneration to not do those things but to live for him. Why? Because he's coming back. Everything in this text is filled with scoffers and doubters who are saying, your Jesus, your king, is actually not ruling and reigning and he won't return. But what Peter is saying, he absolutely will return. And for the Christian, that is very good news. Where their righteous living will be rewarded. And for all those scoffers and haters, their day will come. And everything that they promise to you about the good life will be turned over on their souls, and it will be the bad life for them. The major problem, or the idea of this text, is that scoffers are casting doubt on the church, saying that Jesus is coming back. But Peter is saying, he is coming back, and we know that by what has been said in the past. God will come to purify and to save his people Just like he did through a devastating flood, he will do so by an absolute fire over the earth. So this book, while haunting in many ways, 
amazingly and encouraging, is given to us to give us absolute hope in God. And it's doing this by talking about the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord, choose 27 times in the Old Testament. If you're taking notes and you want to win Bible B later this evening, use 27 times in the Old Testament to talk about God's final coming. It's used five times in the New Testament, often or sometimes used as the day of Christ or the day of the Lord. But what the day of the Lord is, is when God's patience will have run out and he will come to do away with evil like all of us want him to do. And he will come to provide a life, a new life of eternal righteousness for his people and for his namesake. Those who mock the truth will be judged and ruined at the day of the Lord. And those who have trusted in Christ will be rewarded. But they will see the hope that has been promised for a long time. Now, Peter does this in these particular ten verses in three ways. He's talking about the day of the Lord in three ways. The first way, if you're using notes provided for you on the outline, the bulletin that you've been given on the day, and the first that he talks about the day of the Lord is by reminding us of it. He talks about the day of the Lord by reminding you, Christian, of the day of the Lord. And he does this first pastorally. He does this kindly. He's not beating you over the head with it. And we know that because he uses the word beloved. He says, beloved, a second letter. The first one, they were being persecuted. That's what 1 Peter is about. How do Christians pursue the Lord in the midst of persecution? The second one, they're being led astray by false teachers. And so he's talking to them about the day of the Lord by calling them beloved. And then he's saying, you should remember this. Now, you and I don't often remember things. I've got a friend who is highly intelligent. He can recall stuff on an instant, except he seems to forget everything that people talk to him about. He's like, where did that come from? And it's like, Matt, we've talked about that all the time. He's like, I don't care about that. And it's like, I know you don't care because you forget it. And so Peter is saying, if you love this stuff, remind yourself of it. I'd imagine some of you uh, do what is called catechizing your kids, which is a fancy way of saying you on a daily basis or regular basis, you are reminding your children of God and his goodness. I hope even as you might become an adult, you do that on a regular, on a regular uh, pattern or habit where you are reminding one another of who God is and what he has done for his people, where it becomes almost an own catechizing of your own heart to remember God. It is a good thing to remember God's truth in God's word. It's not just enough that we read the Bible throughout the year or we pray certain prayers, but that we remind in our own hearts about God. So he pastorally comes to them and says, beloved, remember this. But he's also aiming to build up their knowledge. He's not just pastorally coming at them, patting them on the head. He's saying, hey, that head that I'm patting on, use it. Remember from last week and the week before, Christians are called to be thoughtful people. That's why we establish schools. It's why we teach our kids to read. It's why we like to buy thick leather books, because we like to know things about God. He's saying he wants to stir up. Look there in the verse, uh, the second part of verse 1. He wants to stir up your sincere mind where he wants the gospel to remain bright, shaking off the rust. He speaks of this severe, uh, sincere mind where these people had believed it. He's treating them as Christians. He's treating them as church members, but he wants to set their minds afire and afresh. And so I think just from this, an application of this text, is that how are we called, how are we being called to be stirred up? If you might think about Monday morning, okay, Lord, another week, another day, another opportunity, I want to be stirred up in the, in the affections of my faith. How might that look like? Well, for you and I, theologically and pedagogically, we, we use words like the means of grace to do this. You pray, you read the Bible, you take the Lord's Supper, you hear the preaching of the word, you infuse yourself. Maybe you memorize scripture or outline it or just pick it apart. You know, inductive learning. The means of grace stir up Christians. There's not this mystical, you know, if you walk around your house like they did in Jericho seven times and it falls over, now you have fire for the Lord. Or maybe you go to Mardell or Ruth's Christian Bookstore and you buy all the books there and you set them all out on your coffee table with your own little coffee there. Now you're set afire. God has given us the means by which we can be stirred up in understanding his grace more and more. Laziness in opposition to being stirred up leads us to evil persuasion, looking at the wrong thing. One person says, slothful flesh smothers truth. 
Slothful flesh smothers truth. So we're called to be stirred up in the faith, just like these people are. Why are they being called to stir up in their faith so that they can have an exciting church? No, so that they can stand against false things that are coming at them. Now, a call from this is that we need godly teachers as much as we need godly receivers. You and I are to be godly receivers in how we receive the stirring up in our affections toward the faith, which calls and demands actually godly teachers to be everywhere in the church. As you meet with one another over a meal, as you go to one another's house just to hang out, as you might sit in a Sunday school class or a small group or even in this setting on a Sunday morning, we need godly teachers in order to stir us up in the affections of the faith where their goal is to deeply impress old truths, not chapter two, new truths, but old truths on the memory of the Christian because men by nature are fond of novelty, but by being reminded of what has been written, we are built up in a knowledge of God. Now, Peter does this in two ways. He does this by building them up in a knowledge of God by looking to the past. Look at verse two of the text there. He builds them up by looking to the past. He calls them holy prophets. You should remember the predictions of the holy prophets. Now what he's doing here is he's talking about the explicit teachings of the Old Testament. He's saying our confidence should be rooted in the Old Testament. I would imagine that many of you, if you were to ask, how do you have confidence in your faith? You might recite words from the New Testament. Letters, words from the New Testament, Gospels. How many of you would go to the Old Testament? That's what Peter is calling this church to hold on to. Commands of the Old Testament, words of the Old Testament. He's telling the churches to not buy the arguments of scoffers in this text because their argument, his argument is, or their argument is rooted in immorality and bad history. And he's saying, don't buy their argument. Look back to the prophets of the Old Testament. Now, let me give you just a little bit of taste. You don't have to turn there. But Psalm chapter 50 says, The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its settings. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and he does not keep silence. Before him is devouring fire and a mighty temptest. He calls to the heavens above the earth that he will judge. So they're doubting that God will judge. And he's saying, look back to the Old Testament, where in our case it says there right in their psalm, that he may judge. And that's typical in wisdom literature of the old, but it's not just in wisdom literature, it's also in prophetic literature. So think about Isaiah 13, maybe turn there later, but just write down Isaiah 13. It says, I will punish the world for its evil. Remember, they were saying he's not going to punish the world, but the Old Testament says, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts and the day of his fierce anger. God is not a wimpy deer walking around in the forest who won't come again for those who are absolutely evil. Peter says, look at what he's already said about himself. And it's not just in the major prophets, it's also in the minor, Malachi chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. And the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Not just one of those topsoil fires that you might do in order to build more vegetation, but it'll go all the way down deep to where there are no longer roots there. That's the kind of judgment that God has spoken about from the old. And those are just some examples. Our Old Testament says that God's judgment on evil is coming. It's definite. You can trust it because of what has been said about it. Now, this is against the scoffers, where the truth of Scripture, in many ways, is used to destroy speculation. These people were really good about not necessarily teaching against the Scriptures, but what they were doing is just raising questions in order for you to doubt. Will that seatbelt hold you? I don't know. Will that roof protect you as that thunderstorm comes? I don't know now. Now I'm doubting this, and now all of a sudden I'm being led astray. Scoffers aren't aiming to teach against the Bible, but they're just aiming to raise the questions, and that's what these people were doing here, and that's not what Peter is advising. He's saying, go to the truth of the Old Testament, but he also does this the second way. He not only says, go back. He says, look at what has been said by the apostles. Look at the end of verse 2. 
that you should remember the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Jude also is a parallel in many ways. You can see them overlapping in some ways of Second Peter. Jude also says this in, in verse 47. But Peter says, remember also the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles, meaning the New Testament. Who wrote the New Testament? The apostles. The New Testament is the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken through the apostles who wrote it by the Spirit's empowerment. So he says, remember the apostles. Now, you've heard me beat this drum a lot. There are many people in our world, in our tradition, around us, who want to elevate what is called the red letters of Scripture above the black letters of Scripture. And what they mean to do is to say, we don't really know how Peter and Paul are arguing against each other. We find that Peter and Paul do argue against each other. But what we can have our absolute hope in is what Jesus has said. Not even about what is said about Jesus, but only about what Jesus has said. So all that stuff from the Old Testament, that seems so old and harsh. And even some stuff from that New Testament that seems so argumentative. Let's just rest our hope in what Jesus has said, which sounds really nice, doesn't it? Let's just see what Jesus has said and build a foundation and an ethic on top of that. Doesn't that sound really nice? Doesn't that sound really cute? But what Jesus has said is that is a false view a demonic view of how God has spoken to his people. What he has said about his apostles, that they should go and what? Teach everything that they know about him. What he has built up his own teaching on. You think of the Sermon on the Mountain, which is what red letter Christians always build up as their primacy in teaching scripture. What does he say in the red letters? Or what does he say in the Sermon on the Mount? Look at what's been said of the old. And what Peter is doing is he's saying, hey, you want to have hope at the end of days? You want to have hope? That your, that your dead spouse, you will see them in the new heavens and new earth. You want to have hope in the reality that you will face your maker and he will say, well done and well done, good servant. How do you have that hope? Look at what has been said about me. Look at what has been said about me all throughout the scriptures. Now, let me give you some things to think about concerning the New Testament. 23 of 27 New Testament books explicitly talk about the day of the Lord. That leaves four remaining who don't. Now, one of those is Galatians, which clearly implies God's return. And the other three are very small books, right? So give them them the benefit of the doubt. They have to pack a lot in. But the day of the Lord is all over the scriptures. God's coming judgment is all over the scriptures. Not just the old, which is seen by some as mean and negative, but also in the new. You want to find out how harsh God is? Look at what Jesus says about what he will do about those who defame his father. There is nothing more harsh than what Jesus says about those who hate him and those who hate his father's ways. The New Testament is full. Some find hundreds of references with warnings about judgment, info about the Lord coming to gather his own, info about the judgment of the wicked, info about the new kingdom and the bringing of eternal righteousness. And so what Peter does is he pulls the Old Testament and the New Testament together and says, friend, remember the Bible. When scoffers come in, when you have doubt in your own heart, Tie yourself to the ballast that will get you through this storm. He tells that he will come in the clouds. He tells that he will come in a flaming fire. He tells that he will come with power and great glory. And so, obviously, the question that you and I have to reckon with is, do we go to the prophets? And do we go to the apostles? It is there, according to God's very word, that you and I will find hope in the end. This is written to Christians, saying, have hope in the midst of the world falling all around you. But friend, do you go to the prophets? Oh, they're so hard to read. They, you know, they're written in poetic form. They indent a lot. It's God's life to you. I went to ESPN.com yesterday, as everyone should on a Saturday afternoon, looking up scores. I find ESPN.com one of the most confusing websites in the world. There's so much information there. Videos are popping up all around us. Oklahoma State's not very good at basketball there, so I'm like nine clicks away from actually finding out what is actually happening there. But you know what? I took time to do it because I loved it. Friends, do you go to the prophets and apostles even though it's, it might take five seconds worth of energy to find a lifetime of hope? Do you read God's testimony? 
Instead of laziness or lack of awareness, do you read God's testimony, which brings you pastoral, intellectual, and scriptural hope? Now, the reason why Peter is doing this is because he wants this church, and friend, he wants our church, that when faced with opposition of false teaching or persecution all around us, he wants them to rest in the hope of God's reign and return. It is the sweetest thing about God altogether, is that he will come from his bride, whom he has bought, and will establish them on the shoulders of giants forever. So he does this by reminding them, but he also does this by showing what scoffers overlook. Secondly, the day of the Lord is coming, and he's saying, scoffers overlook it. Now, why do they overlook it? Why do scoffers overlook the day of the Lord? He says they overlook it because they're justifying their lifestyle. And keep in mind, their lifestyle is salacious, scandalous, and ungodly. Look at verse 3. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Now, last week, I, I talked about this where the scripture is clear that very often you and I might have an ethic that we think is true, but then our actions demand us to change that ethic. And so we do, according to our own fleshly desires. And he's saying a second thing, that these scoffers will come the last days scoffing because of their own sinful desires. Their sinful desires have actually changed their view of the end. And he says they deliberately do this in verse 5, living like there's no consequences. Where we've all, I want you to think about it this way. All of us have in some way had a test that we've supposed to have studied for. Now, how many of us have walked into a classroom, sat down at a desk, sharpened our pencil, and just hope that the teacher will come in and say, actually, we're not going to take the test today. And we're like, oh, oh, the answer from the Lord is this. Or we hope it's an open book. Or we hope that they'll say at the end of the test, you know, actually, you all did so terrible. I'm going to put this thing on a curve. Or I'm going to give you extra credit at the end of the semester. Why? Because we weren't paying attention to the end. We were living in the now. And he's saying this is exactly how these men were doing it. Now, they were overlooking it, but they also are shown in how they're doing it. How do they justify their lifestyle by overlooking the day of the Lord? They do it by asking questions. Verse 4, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? Imagine them looking around and going, I thought he was coming. Where is your God? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, meaning generations have passed, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. What they're doing is they're creating doubt. They're attacking truth in the same way that Satan did this in the garden in Genesis 3. And in the same way that Satan did this in another garden in Matthew 3, where they just ask questions. Where God's word is not seen to be its own best argument, but rather it's needing to be justified from the outside. So they ask questions, whereas the Christian always sees that God's word is its own best argument. Now, they do this by overlooking past catastrophic interventions. So they do this by asking questions, and their questions are supposed to raise doubts about things that have happened in the past. Now, let's just think about what are, what are some past God's intervening ways that have sought destruction on the earth? So they're overlooking this. They're like, I'm not seeing God coming in the future to destroy all evil by overlooking what God has done when he came and destroyed evil. So look at verse 5 and 6. They're overlooking past catastrophic interventions. It says, For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and through water by the word of God. So this is a first intervention. This is talking about the creation of the heavens and the earth. Verse 6, and that by means of these, the world that existed was deluged, which means totally flooded, with water and perished. So that's a second intervention. The earth was formed out of water. We see that in the very beginning, Genesis 1 and 2. We also see it spoken about in Psalm 24, for he had founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The world, no doubt, has its origin from water. And also it was sustained by water, yet it pleased the Lord to use waters for the purpose of destroying it. That's the second thing he's talking about in that, in that second verse there in that section, where the earth was deluged or completely flooded with water. We see this historically in Genesis chapter 7, verse 21, 
This is talking about the Noahic flood. You all know this. Hopefully, you know this at least from Sunday school when you were little. Hopefully, you remember it from last year, a year and a half ago when I preached about it. Genesis 7, verse 21, it all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. And he's bringing this up by saying the scoffers actually overlook that. They overlook the flood. But they also overlook God's catastrophic future. So they overlook the past, meaning the flood, where God wiped out the earth and only rescuing some for his own namesake. But they also overlook what's going, on, what's going to happen in the future. It says in verse 7 of our text, look there, verse 7. By the same word, the heavens and the earth that now existed are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 says, In a flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So what Peter is doing there, he's using something from the old and something that has been predicted about the future, and he's saying they are overlooking this for their own evil purposes. Where just as the earth was obliterated by water in judgment... The, the earth will be burned by fire when God's word comes out at the final judgment. We're just like you couldn't outswim God's wrath. He's saying, friends, these naysayers will not be able to withstand God's heat. The point of the flood was to purify God's world. It had gotten so bad that God was saying, I'm going to purify it. And bring out people whom I'm deemed to be those whom I love. And the point of the fire in the future will also be to purify the world. Where things will have gotten so bad that it is then time for the new heavens and the new earth to come down. Now, just as an aside, I, I think it's, there's, there's some debate on was the flood a whole earth flood, a localized flood, or not even a flood at all. I think you can interpret scripture through scripture by seeing... God is clearly talking about the whole world here in this fire, so I think you can talk about the whole world in the midst of the flood. It seems crazy, doesn't it? It almost seems supernatural, doesn't it? Isn't that the entire scriptures? Where God intervened to bring himself glory, and then a God will intervene to bring himself glory. I think application for this is for you and I to really know the interventions of God. I think you and I have to know the intervention of God from the beginning, the intervention from God at the flood, the intervention of God at his second coming, and also the intervention from God at his first coming. When he did come, he did intervene. The argument is here from Scripture, where scoffers will snub what is written. The argument is here from creation, where scoffers will snub what is proven. But a question that you and I can take home is that are we stirred up by this flood in such a way are we stirred up from this fire in such a way that we actually take into account what God's first coming actually meant for us? More on that in a moment, but I hope that you are encouraged by this text where justice from Christ himself will be placed on his creation, where God, whom those who he has redeemed and those whom he sees as righteous will not be consumed by the fire, for they were not consumed by the flood. We're to be shaken by this also, where judgment is coming for enemies of God, and God promises that he will convert and regenerate people by the means of the gospel being preached. He uses the illustration of floods. He uses the illustration of fire. And in many ways, this should shake us to our very bones by noticing how he acts. I'd imagine some of you have seen the news where there was mass flooding in a particular area where people can only find refuge on the roof of the very houses that are supposed to protect them. What do various people do when they see other people on the top of roofs who need to be rescued so that they will not drown in the water? They do everything they can to reach those people. You imagine a house ablaze with fire. And you see this all the time. Maybe you have encountered this in a personal level. But, but what do particular men and women do when they see that there are bodies inside of a house that is totally being consumed by fire? 
They do everything they can to reach them and pull them out. Now, friends, a takeaway from this is recognizing that because there was a flood and because there is a fire coming, how then are you, Christian, to act in the midst of those two times? God will come to lay waste on wickedness, and he, is, he has appointed a means by which people can hear of his grace, know of his grace, and be rescued by his absolute mercy. It is by your mouth being open. It is by your mouth speaking of the ways of old and the ways of new. It is by your mouth not being silent or asking questions, but by actually talking. By talking of the gospel. This, in many ways, should frighten us, Second Peter. Look at what's coming in such a way that it causes us to live very differently. Not in fear, but with absolute courage. That if God has called me to this place, in this neighborhood, with these neighbors, with these friends, in that cubicle, with that annoying person in my friend group, to tell them about the fire that's going to come. And they won't survive it. The day of the Lord is coming. And Peter says that scoffers will question what God has said in order to justify their lifestyles, in order to defame him with mocking questions by overlooking the past and by overlooking the future. But the question for us is, as we go through this text, why is Peter telling all of us this? It's great to know. So let's let him bring it home. The day of the Lord is coming, and the Lord will bring it. Verses 8 through 10. The day of the Lord is coming, and the Lord will bring it. This is where the gravity of the text sits in. You can imagine like holding up like a, a giant sheet with a hole in the middle, and you've got a ball on that sheet, and you're trying to teeter-totter it around to get that ball in that hole, and really you're finding the gravity of the text in this. And he shows us that God will bring the day of the Lord. 30 years after Christ's ascension, you can imagine these Christians shaking their fists at the sky, burying people around them, enduring suffering on their own half, behalf, and saying, where are you? Verse 8 says, Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. You see this kind of language in Psalm chapter 90, for a thousand years in your sight, are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. They would probably be listening to these false teachers' questions with the pit in their stomach wondering, where is the Lord? And Peter is saying, friend, God's timing is not ours. From our view, it's a long time. But for his, from his view, it is just a moment. And he gives this illustration to tell us that God is operating in ways that are not under our control. And in my flesh, I really don't like that because I, I, th I think I, I'm really smart with like time and effort and what should happen. I don't want him to come now. But Peter is saying that God is transcendent. He's not confined to my schedule. He's not governed by anyone or anything. And that is a really encouraging thing to understand. Being sucked into false teaching. Some people are believing scoffers that God can't do everything because he's powerless and indifferent. And Peter says, a, a thousand years to you is a moment in his time, and he's in charge of all of it. Essentially, Peter is saying for you, it's been a long time. But for God, it's moments. That's all. And it's rich and helpful. And you and I, this is a call for you and I to trust. In the midst of whatever you're going through, you and I are called to trust in God's timing and in God's ways, he answers not, it, his answers not, are not only about Christ coming back, but also what Christ is doing in the meantime. Why hasn't Christ returned? Back at chapter 2 says, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. I've slowly been reading a biography about um, the emperor Napoleon. Um, I hope that impresses you. Uh, I, I'm on page nine. 
Um, I've, been reading it for, I've been reading it for three weeks. But I didn't know much about Napoleon and all the things that he invented when it comes to modern warfare. It, it was him who perfected the idea of an army waiting for an invading army to come in. Wait, 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 wait more, wait more. Their, their sword is almost to your face now. And he swallows them from the side and in the front and the back. You and I have a hard time waiting for the Lord to do what he wants to do because we have so many suggestions for him. But friend, look at what God is doing in the midst of our waiting. Look at verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. One person said the Lord defers his coming so that he might invite all man to repentance. His goal in here is that all would come to understand him and know him and respond to him. It is not because he is slow. It is not because he can't keep a promise. It is not because he is unfaithful to his own word, which promises this. It is not because he doesn't care. It is because, amazingly, you can think of all the attributes and about the existence of God. It's because he's patient in bringing people to repentance. This, in many ways, this passage is so humbling. It's encouraging. It blows me away at his patience towards his people. It's daunting, though, as well. You look at your own testimony and how God has intervened and saved your life. Uh, maybe some of you became Christians last year, 2023. That is 2,000 years after Christ ascended into heaven. 2,000 years. Aren't you glad that he was patient? Or what about the person who told you about Christ? All the events of how they came to know Christ. Aren't you glad that God was patient for them? A lot of our own testimonies is the most observe, uh, uh, absurd correlating effects if we were to choose our own path. You know, the choose your own story, uh, choose your own story books where you choose this way or that way. Almost all of our confer conversions are the most confusing things in the world. Why did I go to that school and walk down that street and meet that person who took an interest in me and told me about that thing? Why did I lose my job to where I'm on my knees and I call out to the Lord, I've literally got nothing and I need you and now I understand it. What about the smashing of a car that unsettled your soul to where you go, I can't trust anything around me. Friend, aren't we glad that God is patient? And what is he patient for? Now, in many ways, like I said, this passage is daunting. This is a daunting passage. If you're here, you're not a Christian. It is right for you to know that our God, and we pray that he would be your God someday, it is right for you to know that our God is long-suffering. It is right for you to know that our God is patient. It is, it is right for you to know that, you know, to use a baseball illustration, that our God has a long wind-up, or maybe a batter has that long spread where his feet are coiling like a snake. But you need to understand that he will not be long or he, will not be or he will not be patient forever. He will not recoil forever. He will not wait forever. There is a day when fire will come. One of Satan's best tools is getting you to think that you have plenty of time before you die. You and I are obsessed some of you and I are obsessed with prolonging your own death. You and I are obsessed with wondering about will it be 80 years or 90 years or 100 years? We're obsessed about reminding ourselves it won't be today. It won't be tomorrow. I'll stay in my house today and it won't be today. But one of Satan's best devices is getting you to think that you have plenty of time before you die to consider your own eternal welfare. And so you need to understand that this is a promise for you, non-Christian, that you do not have all the time of the day. You do not have all the time of your own life. He calls you to what the Bible says is a repentance from your sin. He calls you to see him for who he is. Go to him as you would repent of your sins to recognize that you don't have anything to bring to the table when it comes to surviving a fire. You don't have enough fire-retardant coats. 
You are not schooled enough in bringing your own water cans to when this blaze will happen. You really don't. And those are all figurative languages for what you really need to reckon with. Is that someday you will meet your maker. And he says, your rap sheet is not good enough. But he also says that you can emplace your trust. You can have eternal life if you actually give yourself over to the rap sheet of the one who did come for you. Being Christ Jesus. Who lived perfectly. So that you can place your trust in him. So that his perfect deeds would be accounted to you. And what this is doing is supposed to alarm you. Which is a nice Christian way of saying scare you to death. It's to heighten your senses of going, I will not survive the end unless the one who had end brought on himself is aiming to hold me up in survival. Now, there's a little bit of language here. I've gone on a long time, but I don't care. There's a little bit of language here that says any will perish or that he doesn't want any to perish. And I'll just say that briefly of saying, I think a way to translate this and a way to see this is that the Lord is patient toward y'all, the second person plural, is patient toward y'all, meaning to this church, He's not wishing that any of you would perish. So run away from this false teaching. Don't follow these false teachers. But he wants you to reach repentance. He wants you to come to him, to come back to him if you have been going astray. He's not willing that any should perish here. He's also talking about the declarative or the ordaining will of God versus the desired will of God. God wants, God desires that all would come to him in faith. Friend, if you're, if you're here wondering, as a non-Christian, does God actually want you to come to him in faith? Listen to this text. He very much does. And if you deny him, the effects will be of what this text says. But it is a fruitful and joyful thing to get to verse 10, where it says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works are done on it will be exposed. This will be done toward the ungodly. It will be done like a thief. This will be done toward the ungodly, where the heavens will pass away like a roar. Now, this is not a roar like an MGM lion. This is a roar like an arrow whistling through the air. (sighs) Where heavenly bodies, all the elements of the world will be destroyed by fire. They'll be purged with fire. I think hearkening back to Jesus' own words in Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall away from the heaven, and the powers over the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And then they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, which means the world, and one end of heaven to the other, meaning all places. And so you and I have to reckon with God's return that will either be a triumph on behalf of his people or a triumph over wickedness and evil. Now, maybe you're busy ignoring it. Maybe you're overlooking it. Maybe you think you have time to consider the spiritual things at another time, but the scripture is clear that the day of the Lord is coming and it will be unruthless to the ungodly. God's enemies won't be able to outswim it as they hadn't done in the past and they won't be able to withstand its heat. I wonder if you remember and can recall the amazing story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three young men defined the mighty king of Nebuchadnezzar Their action caused them to be thrown into a fiery furnace by penalty for refusing to obey the king's command. Now, they were obeying God's command instead of the king's command. And so this earthly king threw them into this pit of fire where everyone who goes into the fire dies from it. In fact, it is such a hot fire that those who were throwing these men into the fire also burned up. So these men were thrown into the fire. They fell bound into the fire, Daniel chapter 3 says. But in that midst, King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, it says, and he rose up and he ran to where this was and he said, didn't you cast these men bound into the fire? Not just in there, but they were bound up. And they said, yes. And King Nebuchadnezzar said, well, how come I see four men in the fire unbound? Why are they walking around? They don't appear hurt. In the appearance of the fourth, they only threw in three. The appearance of the fourth is like the son of gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door, the burning fire, 
and he called out to them. And then Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego came out of the fire. Friends, just imagine this circumstance here. And all the king's counselors saw that the hair on their heads were not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. You need to understand that this text never calls into question Jesus' return. It is absolutely a certain. But the question for you is, will you be saved at the end by having faith in God in Christ, the one who preserved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire, or will that fire come and by your rejecting, by your overlooking, by your non-repenting, will that fire come for you? Unlike everyone else in Daniel 3, it crushed them. But unlike those who were standing by the one who came to save them, well, they're the ones that have confidence, like you can from this text. They're the ones that won't be crushed by God. Let's pray together.